Social media is turning us antisocial. We're spending more time on our phones than we are face to face. Social media is disconnecting us from our real communities. Recently, social media has been attacked for putting us into echo chambers and shifting our society away from real world interaction. People cry, with all this connection, we're more disconnected from each other than ever before. But is that really true? I want you to take a moment and think about your community. Who is in your community? What community are you a part of? We have our family, our friends, our racial and ethnic communities, among others, but what about the community that lives in the palm of your hand? Does anyone remember what social media was originally created to be? Facebook, Instagram, even Twitter, what did their creators set out to accomplish with these sites? Community and connectivity. Places where people can engage with other people all over the world, unbridled by restraints of time and space. This is the landscape that I and countless other Gen Zers grew up in. We exist in virtual spaces that render borders arbitrary and time zones irrelevant. We maintain connections with people we've met halfway across the world, and we build new friendships with people we've never even met in person. We build communities every day we open our phones, even if we don't realize it. I certainly didn't realize I had this ability to create something as profound as a community. In fact, most of my life, I felt like I didn't have one at all. I was found abandoned at the gates of an orphanage in Guixi, China on Christmas Eve. Clearly a newborn, judging from my hastily tied off umbilical cord, I was taken into the orphanage by a man who by chance heard me crying on his way into work. Adopted soon after, I became an immigrant to the United States via transnational adoption, ending up in the frozen, isolated town of Kenai, Alaska. Now, Kenai is a small town, around 7,000 in size, where people wear rubber fishing boots to fancy dinners and run dog sleds in the winter. It is also extremely white. And it was here where I found myself being raised by a white single mother, thousands and thousands of miles away from my Chinese roots and any significant Asian American presence or community. Against this backdrop of whiteness, I grew up an outsider. I can still remember the first time someone called me chink. I was 12 years old. Walking down the hallway of Kenai Middle School, I heard it from behind me and it stopped me in my tracks. I just remember feeling so alone. People would tell me, go back to your own country, a clear indicator that I did not belong to their community, that they did not claim me. I tried connecting to my Asian roots, but because I was adopted and had no knowledge of my biological Chinese parents, I wasn't accepted into the Asian community either. Rejected by both communities, I straddled the labels of Asian and American, all the while longing for a community where I truly felt like I belong. It would take an entire childhood in Alaska, three years in Oregon, and six months in China before I finally realized the community I sought, I had already built. The catalyst for this realization was COVID-19. March of 2020, COVID-19 had seriously started to hit the United States, and people were in a frenzy about who to blame and what to do. Former President Donald Trump responded with two words, Chinese virus. And suddenly, everyone had someone to blame and something to do. The enemy had been named, and it was China. It was Chinese Americans. It had a face, and it was mine. I reached out to other Asian Americans I had met throughout my life over social media, and conversation after conversation shifted towards them talking about how scared they were, how alone they felt in a time of rising anti-Asian sentiment and indiscriminate hate crimes. And what they said, I felt. I saw, I understood. I was finally a part of a community, one that I had built unconsciously through friend requests and usernames, but one that I now relied upon to get me through this troubling period. Their stories mobilized me to create Asian in America, a video project about the Asian American experience. This project, which I put together in honor of May, which is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, brought my community together. I connected with old friends, new ones, even strangers I hadn't met in person yet, and we shared our Asian American experience together. We couldn't meet in person. Physical distance and barriers such as COVID-19 stood in the way of that, but through our virtual community, 
we still found an outlet to release our pain, our joy, and our pride in being Asian American. Hearing from people like me who understood my struggles and experiences was validating. It was therapeutic. In a pandemic, in different states, countries, and cultures, we came together and did the one thing all humans need to do, connect. All because I realized the power of social media and a better way to utilize my social media network. So the next time that you look through your followers or your Facebook friends or your Twitter feed, I want you to really look. Do you see people or potential partners? You know, followers or fellow change makers. Do you see individuals or do you see a community? Social media is an extension of our very nature as humans and it has allowed us to, without barriers, create communities. As Gen Zers, we have to start thinking about social media creatively by looking at its possibilities. Because we have the technology, we have the capacity, and we have the communities. Now realize that power and get to work. I vividly remember my dad teaching little four-year-old me how to work the VCR player so I could entertain myself and my sister. When my mom brought home her new rollerball Blackberry, I spent hours playing Brick Breaker, watching the ball bounce and spin on the screen, pixelated bricks crumbling in its wake. I made my first email account at the age of 11 and then proceeded to illegally sign up for Facebook. I got my first smartphone in middle school and by high school, my friends and I were given personal computers to do our schoolwork with. Gen Z has been subject to what is perhaps the most rapid growth of technological innovation since the Industrial Revolution. We have had technology at our fingertips for most, if not all, of our lives, evolving and changing faster than ever before. While this may seem daunting to anyone else, Gen Z is completely unfazed. We grew up and are still growing up in the era of social media and online interpersonal engagement. This gives Gen Z a distinct advantage when it comes to being a catalyst for change. One 60 second video, 240 character tweet, or Instagram infographic has the ability to reach millions of people globally. So how can we take the algorithm by the reins and use social media as a catalyst for change? Let's take a look at local, national, and global initiatives using social media to spread a message and examine some strategies you can use to be your own catalyst for change. On July 1st, 2020, the Instagram account Weavers of Unity posted a photo of the flag of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Oregon. Around the flag was a watering can, plastic water bottles and jugs, a mask, a baby bottle, and a bowl. At the top read the phrase, water is life. Members of the Warm Springs Reservation have been dealing with water infrastructure issues since 2019. And COVID-19 is making it ever so grimly clearer just how important access to clean water truly is. Since the post was made, it has been liked over 2,000 times. And Central Oregonians have organized bottled water drives and donated money to the Chush Fund, all proceeds of which go towards the $200 million estimated total for the cost of repairs. Since its inception, as of November 2020, the Tish Fund has raised over $650,000 since its inception in 2019, most of, which was made most of which was received after the post was made. This one post allowed me to be aware of an issue happening unbeknownst to me in my own backyard and allowed people to gain resources to put towards an existing crisis so that they could allocate resources towards an ever mounting one. In November of 2020, citizens of the U.S. held their breath as votes rolled in for the presidential election. But a crucial senatorial vote went almost completely unnoticed. The final tally resulted in the need for a senatorial runoff election in Georgia to be held in January. Candidate John Ossoff then took to TikTok in an effort to engage voters, specifically young voters, and register to them to vote. Ossoff quickly amassed over 450,000 followers. However, due to TikTok's unique algorithm, his videos were consistently viewed by millions of people. Ossoff's strategy of engaging young voters on a platform they were familiar with led to a stark increase in voter turnout. And the resulting election, like the previous one, showed an immense increase in voter turnout. Ossoff even won by a margin of 54,000 votes. 
Engaging these people on a platform they were familiar with allowed them to be engaged, and they will likely continue to remain politically active and engaged in elections down the road. This gives them the ability to vote on local, state, and federal issues directly impacting them and their community. On October 15, 2017, actress Alyssa Milano, one of several who accused Harvey Weinstein of acts of sexual assault, made a post to her Twitter account. The tweet read, if you have been sexually harassed or assaulted, reply me too in the comments of this post. This post reignited the use of the hashtag me too, which got its start in 2006 by a woman named Tarana Burke to advocate for and provide resources to survivors of sexual assault. The post was liked over 20,000 times and replies poured in not just from celebrities, but also average everyday people. Five letters and a hashtag allowed tens of thousands of people to share their experiences on sexual assault and even prompted states and companies to change workplace policies surrounding sexual assault. Historically, social media has been viewed as a net bad. The rapid evolution and growth of social media has led to a lack of restrictions on what is posted and a lack of credibility to what can be posted. In addition, Gen Z is completely involved in cancel culture, which is the discontinuation of support for a public figure based on their actions both in person and over social media. But instead of focusing on the harm that social media can cause, use these examples as evidence and help for inspiring change in this way. Be true to yourself and your message. Don't try to perform or be larger than life to appease an algorithm. Engage with your audience and make a meaningful connection. Make them believe that what you are doing matters, that them engaging with your content matters. Reboot how Gen Z views and interacts with social media in an effort to upgrade our society. Revolutionize how technology works for you and it will revolutionize your environment. Post well, post loud, post often, and post from the heart. I am going to begin talking about service learning today with why. And I'm going to talk about my own experience with service learning. And I'm going to give a nod to Simon Simic, who gave a great TED talk called Starting With Why. So before I really jump into this, I want to take a moment to define service learning, because it'll be a much more sensible talk if we both know what service learning is. So service learning is traditionally a credit-bearing course where student learning outcomes are applied to community needs. The community is the partner. They address real problems that emanate from the community, and we bring knowledge from both the academic and community side, and they're mutually and reciprocally beneficial, and we grow our capacity. So here's my story. I was a faculty member who taught visual communication. My community partner was a social service provider, and their need was for a new branding system. They wanted to write grants, to identify their vans, their shirts, their signage, and they wanted to show that they were the competent organization that they really were. So what our partner did, they worked with second graders, kids that the data indicated were very unlikely to graduate from high school. They committed to providing those second graders, those are seven-year-old kids, with an adult mentor until they graduated from high school. Hopefully that was at 18. I invited the director of this service provider to our class, and she came with mentors. And they talked about their kids. They talked about kids who lived in apartments with no beds, who had closets with no hangers. And they had no idea how to answer a question like, did you have lunch? Because they really had never had organized meals. If we believe the data, it was highly unlikely that these kids would have a very bright future. Our community partner focused on the kids. They were not there to call out faculty, cook, call out families, or call the cops. They told us that some of the kids lived just a few blocks from campus where we were meeting. Here's a why for me. After class, a student came up to me and she said, I had no idea that less than two miles from here, there were kids that really needed that kind of commitment. So here's a little bit of the how. So I structured a project on branding and identity. Trust me, that's a very solid visual communication project. 
students wrote a brief together that was approved by the community partner, and then they actually went out and began to design work. They thought about symbolism, they thought about meaning, and the nitty gritty of design principles and typography. What would we have done if we didn't have service learning? Well, we probably would have used a case study, a very traditional approach, but that doesn't have the same depth or frankly the same kind of meaning that a service learning project does. We integrated the community partner into the process. So we would talk about design principles, we would talk about our brief, and our par partner would give us very focused feedback. We got a comment one time exactly like this. While we may see the fingerprints in our design as a mark of identity, our kids will see it as a mark of incarceration. I structured the work as a continuous improvement and selection process, winnowing the designs down until ultimately only one was selected. So there were 30 students in the class, 29 did not have their designs selected. Was it a success? Well, it really was a microcosm of how you structure a process like this. So the students learned all of the steps that they would have learned in a non-service learning class. They had all of the learning outcomes. They learned about design and application in the real world. Who makes decision? On what schedule? It's a lot messier than the very neat academic setting. The students learn to bring their assets, not just their academic assets, but their personal experience. And they learned they could use their powers for good, and it has a really long and lasting impact on their own identities. Their identities as students, and their identities as members of the community. One day at the end of the semester, a student came into class and told me she had gone to a soccer game over the weekend and saw the kids wearing the shirts from our community organization. And she said, I saw our logo. It wasn't her design that had won, but it was her effort and her contribution. And for me, that was a why. The organization was invited to the White House, and they went wearing the shirts with our new brand on it. So the big picture, I spent many years working with faculty across institutions to think about how to integrate service learning into their work. There was already great work going on at Linfield University. The Dory Project, a multifaceted project that the theater and communication arts department had, was based on the one remaining Dory fleet that goes out of Pacific City. And they included oral history, theater, exhibition. We have a microbiology of grapes and wine where students are learning about the microbiome and its potential to influence the terroir of wine. We have an environmental studies program where students are partnering over a two-course sequence with the Yamhill County watershed, and that project has gone on for multiple years. Elsewhere, I've worked with students to be neutral conveners, students who have worked with the sheriff's office in their local community to develop a, um, to develop a survey about community experience with that office, not something the office probably could have done themselves. I've helped Nike to develop programs in their nonprofit sphere to encourage students, young kids to participate in sports and community members to volunteer as coaches. And I've worked with food banks about developing policies that uh, take into account diversity, equity, and inclusion. So service learning does not need to look any one particular way. It needs to be as flexible and as expansive as the academic work we do and as the needs of our community partner. We might envision students working in a social provider's facilities, but that's really only one model. In the project I described, we never went to our community partner's offices. They were tiny, and in fact, their work was done in the community. It was done in libraries, it was done in museums, it was done in the park. There are many considerations for how, and at the beginning, for faculty and students, and community partners, they seem just all-encompassing. Semesters are not aligned with the real world. Transportation to and from is difficult. Community partners have their own schedules. They have boards that may need to approve things. And they have volunteers with busy schedules. And none of that may actually align with what we need. Sometimes the organizations who have the very most need are the least able to coordinate with us. And those organizations, all of them, probably do not have spring break or the other kinds of breaks we take in the year. Ultimately, I don't think it should thwart us because less than two miles from here, we can find the why of service learning. The story that I want to talk about today, like many of the ones I told before, begins in Venezuela. It has to do with the Central University of Venezuela. Founded in 1721, it is the oldest university in the country 
and it's one of the oldest ones in the Western Hemisphere. I've always been fascinated by this institution, mostly for three reasons. The first one, it's campus. University City is one of the most wonderful endeavors of Venezuelan architecture. It has been granted the status of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and honestly, it's a source of pride for many Venezuelans. Number two, it's the fact that I firmly believe that if it wasn't for the humanitarian crisis that casted me, my family, and millions of other Venezuelans into different corners of the world, I would have probably attended the Central University. Third is its motto. I've always been captivated by the motto of this school. It's, esta es la casa que vence a las sombras which in Spanish means, this is the house that defeats the shadows. I've been pondering many times about this motto, and it has made me realize that the way that we think about shadows in relationship with knowledge can be a little bit more productive. You see, you don't have to look very far away in popular media to find depictions of shadows as something that has to be defeated, shadow then being an amorphous analogy for something that is evil. However, I don't think that's how the process of learning works. You see, when you are writing a policy proposal, when you're solving a calculus sheet, or when you're trying to analyze a poem, you are not defeating the shadows. The results in that calculus sheet, the derivatives and the integrals, are not a threat. The perspective that you gain from analyzing a poem is not evil. And when you're trying to craft a policy proposal, and this might be a little bit weird, you're not trying to defeat evil in the world, but you're trying to make something that's good. The process of learning is not an ever constant bickering against shadows, but rather a long journey to discover the unknown things within them. I firmly believe that Gen Z is uniquely positioned to make a good contribution in the world. How does it achieve so? I think it achieves so by participating in the liberal arts. Now, defining the liberal arts is a very complicated thing. In fact, I think that using a concept like we use for most things is not the most productive approach. The liberal arts is a conversation, a conversation that has been had by centuries, by scholars, citizens, politicians, about what is the knowledge that people need to be free. Now, this is not knowledge in the traditional sense of loose facts rattling in our heads, but rather skills. The skills that citizens need to be active and productive members in their society. Gen Z can participate in this long conversation because it has grown up in the largest expansion of information technology in history. A recent study by the University of California stated that a normal person consumes around 30 gigabyte, 34 gigabytes of information per day. That's a 300% increase in the last 10 years. And we've seen TikTok feeds, we've seen Twitter feeds, the amount of information that we're consuming is increasing drastically every day. What I'm trying to say here is that Gen Z has grown up learning how to engage, interact, and most importantly, create very complex forms of information. We have been training since a very young age the skills that we need to be productive members of society. We can continue participating and thinking about what are the ways in which we can make a difference. The shadows cannot be defeated. In fact, I don't think they have to. I think we need to embrace the shadows. By this, I don't mean embracing ignorance, rather the opposite. Boldly look into the shadows and using the knowledge that we've gained and standing in a conversation that has happened from centuries before us to boldly find something bright within them. Because I'm pretty sure if we look deep enough, we will achieve so. Explaining who I am to other people, specifically my ethnicities and how I identify culturally, has drastically impacted my perceptions and understandings of complex life issues. Growing up on the island of Oahu, or having multiple ethnicities as the norm meant I never had to think twice about my identity as a Japanese and white woman. We have the luxury of specificity in Hawaii, and this is evident in the everyday language one uses to describe yourself. You're not just Asian. You're Taiwanese, Thai, Filipino, Korean, Japanese, or Chinese. You're not just Pacific Islander. You're 
Maori, Samoan, Tahitian, Tongan, Guamanian, Chamorro, and especially if you're Hawaiian, you're native Hawaiian. I'm gonna take a quick sidestep to say it loud and proud as someone who is of non-native Hawaiian descent, but was born and raised on the island of Oahu. Not everyone who is from Hawaii is Hawaiian. It isn't the same as being from Oregon where you are an Oregonian. Hawaiian is an ethnicity, not a geographical denotation. But I digress. Living in McMinnville, attending a predominantly white institution, and having conversations with people from all across the Pacific Northwest, I realized that some had never talked to or been friends with someone who was even part Asian. I even had an experience with someone who didn't mean this at all out of malicious or malintent tell me that they were shocked to find out that I was actually Japanese. When I jokingly then asked them, why did you think that? They then said, oh, well, you don't look Japanese, like your eyes don't look Asian. To say I was stunned would be putting it lightly. That moment forever changed my perception of who I am and how the world, world sees me as a multi-ethnic person. It made thousands of questions about identity swirl around in my head. What is an Asian person supposed to look like? What does that even mean? Do multi-ethnic people like myself not exist? I had the privilege of embracing both sides of my family growing up and seeing people like me reflected in all areas of my life. And probably the most important and instrumental to my development as a person, the sports I played and watched. I never had to question my capability of being able to play sports and how race did or did not affect that outcome. It boiled down to whether you were good enough to make the team, plain and simple. But Unfortunately, that wasn't a common experience in other parts of the United States. So imagine my literal excitement when I discovered the legend that is Naomi Osaka. Reigning from the country of Japan, a 23-year-old woman of Haitian and Japanese descent just absolutely dominating the international tennis scene. I finally saw my multi-ethnic experience reflected in one of the most influential sports icons of my generation and probably generations to come. But Mainstream media and the rest of the world didn't see it that way. A common dilemma and identity crisis that many multi-ethnic people face is the picking and choosing of what others see and latch onto. It's a fine line and something I'm still grappling with myself. Pulling from my personal experience, the way that the media has depicted Naomi Osaka since her rise to prominence has been appalling to say the least. From instant noodle advertisements blatantly whitewashing her to the selective language used whenever she expresses any sort of emotion, she has had her ethnicities pitted against each other whenever it's convenient for other people. For example, she can't come across as mad to any degree or then she's labeled as the angry black woman. But if she were to show some form of being reserved or composed, people would then associate her modesty, honesty, humility, and politeness to her Japanese heritage as stated in a 2019 Japan Times article titled, How Japanese is Naomi Osaka? How messed up is that? Mixedness can't be broken down into clear cut sections and comparing one person's experience with their mixed heritage to another is virtually impossible. Japanese media journalists have even gone to the extreme lengths of explicitly asking her to speak in Japanese when responding to their questions. And when she said she'd be able to give clearer answers in English, the validity of her Japanese-ness was then up for debate since she isn't a fluent speaker. Naomi has had to constantly fight for her respect within the tennis world, across multiple countries, and validate her identity as a multi-ethnic woman. But should she even have to? Is there some unspoken rubric of being biracial that mixed people are being graded from and I'm just not aware of it? And on top of all of this, she's also had to endure gender oppression. Rui Hachimura is a black and Japanese male athlete in the NBA, and while he's had to face similar instances of discrimination, there's a difference when you're a six foot eight dude in one of the most popular sports leagues in the United States. In the US, a country that has had a long history of oppressive acts towards black people through slavery and segregation, and the illegal incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, embracing Naomi Osaka and her success means simultaneously reckoning with all of that. Multi-ethnic people exist. Although an athlete like Naomi Osaka may seem like a distant topic from our everyday lives, her experience doesn't exist in a vacuum. Whether it be in the form of conscious or unconscious microaggressions, blatantly oppressive social media captions, or everyday conversations, we are surrounded by language and communication on a daily basis. Looking at Naomi, how do you understand her situation as a multi-ethnic individual? 
is that understanding of the negative impacts of oppression somehow different for the black and Asian people in your own life? If it is different, why is that? We have countless opportunities to take positive actions to address these issues on a daily basis here at Linfield University. The communities around us are filled with multi-ethnic people, their stories, and their experiences. Listen to them. Challenge your previous assumptions. Step forward with genuineness and a willingness to learn. Ask clarifying questions. Approach conversations about culture and ethnicity with honesty, humility, and empathy. Naomi Osaka is an amazing athlete and outstanding Grand Slam champion. But perhaps more importantly, she reminds us of our obligation to be good allies and strong advocates for the multi-ethnic people in our own lives. In the book, David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell states that those with dyslexia triumph in spite of their disability. But they are so smart and so creative that not even a lifetime of struggling with reading can stop them. This quote implies that those with dyslexia can have success, and that their success might even be correlated with their struggles. This is reflected in data from the American Management Association, which found that 35% of entrepreneurs in the United States have dyslexia. In some ways, though, this story is a glamorized or glorified version of what we know about grit and dyslexia. In order to truly examine an issue, I believe that we must move beyond that. So for a second, I want us to focus on a different story, one about Amir Barker. Amir was interviewed in 2012 by the Learning Disability Association of America. His story is as follows. Amir was someone who was labeled stupid and dumb and hopeless in school. He began hiding in school hallways to avoid spelling tests and later joined street gangs for community. At 23, he was incarcerated. At the time of his incarceration, he was diagnosed with dyslexia. After this, he got his high school degree and a GED. Later on, he went on to create four independent films, write an autobiography, and he was even on Oprah. He was someone who was able to succeed in spite of his struggles, someone who was able to do what Malcolm Gladwell suggested about defying things. But that's not the most important part of his whole story. The other part is reflected in data. In a, in a survey done in Texas in 2000, it was found that 48% of incarcerated in adults had dyslexia, and two-thirds struggled with reading compre comprehension. And the National Adult Literacy Survey, it was found that 70% of incarcerated adults don't have above a fourth grade reading level. And dyslexia is often a reason for low literacy. So what does this say about a mirror, you might ask? Well, it says that he's one of many. He is many. He's one of many individuals who struggled with reading and ended up incarcerated. He's one of many individuals that had success in spite of being dyslexic. To go further into this, Amir is someone who represents a broken system, one in which you're more likely to get diagnosed for dyslexia in prison than you are in public school. In saying this, it's incredibly important to think about the implication of this on society at large. Before I continue with this story, I want to do a couple of things. The first is talk about my personal experience with dyslexia, as well as the scientific definition for dyslexia, and how many people have it. I was diagnosed with dyslexia in third grade. I was blessed with a multisensory phonics brief program called Orton Gillingham, which is incredibly effective in teaching dyslexic students how to read, write, and spell. I believe that that program is one of the reasons why I am here today. In saying this, you might wonder, so what makes dyslexia so challenging? Well, this is a little bit complicated as scientists themselves can't even seem to define dyslexia. There are a myriad of reasons for this. One of these reasons is that we don't really know where dyslexia comes from in the brain. Another one of these reasons is that we're not quite sure what the symptoms for it are because they're defined, there's lots of them and people experience them differently. 
what we do know about dyslexia is that it's a genetic and neurobiological learning disability that causes a defects in the brain's ability to comprehend the phonological component of language. In short, having dyslexia makes it really hard to read, write, or spell, which are all skills that are needed in our society today. You might also be wondering, how many people does dyslexia affect? Well, 20%. 20% or one out of every five individuals has dyslexia. This is enough that having dyslexia and this many people having it could have massive implications on our society as a whole, which is incredibly important to think about when we think about what we want to do, especially considering the fact that when people ha with dyslexia are given the resources that they need, they can do incredible things. Consider people like David Nealman, the founder of JetBlue, David Boyce, who's a famous trial lawyer, or Cheryl Thompson Chill, who's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. All these people have dyslexia. The solution for this problem is not easy. It involves everything from funding public education to understanding individualized education plans and how they can be changed. In saying this, it's incredibly important to think about what we could do. Based on the research I have done, as well as the research others have done, it is incredibly clear that doing a universal multi-sensory phonics-based program like the one I did in all elementary school classrooms could be effective in teaching all students. This kind of program is good for teaching both neurotypical or non-dyslexic students and dyslexic students how to read, write, and spell. It's based on science. It's also incredibly effective. Doing a program like this would also decrease discrepancies in understanding of language between those who are dyslexic and those who are neurotypical, which is incredibly important in our society today. As we need as many people to understand language as possible, when thinking about how we want to change the world, I often think about the fact that generations want to redo whole systems. And while I believe that this kind of drastic change is important, I really believe that it's important to look at the small things that could have a big impact. And I believe that changing the world and making it better for dyslexics is one of those things that could happen. In saying this, I genuinely think that this is the next thing that Gen Z should think about. Unfortunately, Gen Z is not posed in a position where we are capable of doing this because of our age level. We're not in the administrative level to do this. One thing that we can do is advocate for things. This is clear in everything that we have done. Everything from Me Too movement to Black Lives Matter to climate change and voting, as well as gun laws. Gen Z can change the world through advocating for things. This is already clear. I believe that this is the next thing that Gen Z should put its momentum behind. After all, we are the people that are currently living in the educational system or that just graduated from it. We are the people that are impacted by this the most. We know that the system is broken. We know that the change needs to come, and it's our time to make it happen. Let me tell you about the first time in college that I felt afraid. Freshman year, Dylan. I'm watching the news with my new soccer teammates. Super weird, I know. I've been at Linfield for 27 hours, and we are the best of friends. And to commemorate this newfound friendship, I decide, because I'm a social butterfly and I obviously know how to read a room, that I would comment on what we're watching. Colin, Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the national anthem. Now I was expecting a simple exchange, perhaps a quick alignment of our political views, to which one of my teammates said loudly, with confidence drift dripping off of every word. If you don't like it here, go back to your tribe. Sweat, and not from my morning run, ran down my back and my neck. I felt gross, I felt tense. Thoughts reeling through my head in quick succession. Confusion, well, she probably didn't mean it, right? Oh God, I says, of course she meant it. This is, this is racism. Frustration. Fuck, my mom was so right. And the worst thought of all, what do I do about it? 
This is my first official day meeting these girls. I want to make friends. I want to not be alone. I want to be a part of the whole. But I had to choose between my identity and friendship. So I took a deep breath, buried my anxiety deep within me, and I turned my body towards hers. Now today I'm going to talk to you about two of my biggest fears. I am afraid of hate, and I'm afraid of white people. Now I've always thought the two have a pretty decent relationship. They can kind of rely on one another to get the job done. And the easy thing about my fear of both of these things is that their relationship has a name. It's called white rage. Now white rage presents itself in a few different areas and it's definitely not a new occurrence. It presents itself in privilege, politics, and punishment. It presents itself in privilege. And privilege does not mean being able to call the cops and be treated with respect and safety. That is just a basic human right. I'm talking about the privilege that breeds entitlement. I'm talking about Brett Kavanaugh literally raging in a Senate hearing because he thinks he won't get what he wants. It culminates in politics. White rage is in every law that's passed that demonizes minorities and cuts off paths to BIPOC success. It is in voter ID laws in racially diverse areas, and it is in the 2020 election fraud conveniently found in cities of predominantly black people, like Georgia, oh, well, that's not a city, Atlanta, Milwaukee, or Detroit. And it culminates in punishment. White rage culminates in violence. It culminates in Charleston, it culminates in anti-blackness, and it culminates in the 2021 January 6th insurrection attempt. Now, white rage, violent white rage, is poor white rage. It is what BIPOC most often experience, it is what is most often feared, and now it is what we will work with. So let's start with a history lesson. White rage is rooted in slavery. With the introduction of chattel slavery, the American economy shifted, and poor white non-slave owners were economically closer to enslaved Africans than wealthy white masters. To maintain their systems of oppression, wealthy white elites gave poor white people privilege and made their whiteness more important than their financial well-being. Martin Luther King Jr. says that white people are put into the position of supporting your oppressor because through prejudice and blindness, you fail to see that the same forces that oppress Negroes oppress poor white people. And honestly, I get why you're mad. You got plagued by the same wealthy white elites back then and today in health care, in tax cuts, in raising the minimum wage, your rage lines the pockets of wealthy white elites. Now that we've talked about history, we can talk solutions. What the hell does this have to do with Gen Z? What do we do about it? You might be tempted to run away. You might be tempted to become a nihilist. But I believe differently. I believe in reaching out and reconnecting with our white peers. And I already have a model for this. In the 1960s, Fred Hampton, chairman of the Chicago Black Panther Party, built up a coalition of Puerto Rican, white, and black individuals. They understood that poor black people, poor indigenous people, poor white people, and poor people of color are all in need of similar resources. This relates to Gen Z because my generation has a tendency to think of civil rights leaders as middle-aged. But Fred Hampton was doing this when he was 21, and I'm 21 right now. I'm not saying this is going to be a walk in the park. It's going to take work, real work. It's going to take real empathy. And it's going to force us to have the understanding that some people are afraid of change. But white people have to be involved in the fight for equity, not because we're prioritizing white voices in BIPOC communities, but because we deserve to feel safe, 
We deserve to feel secure, and we have been the scapegoat for wealthy white atrocities before, and I will not let it happen to our generation as well. I know we can do this because I've done it. Do you remember Go Back to Your Tribe? I was so frustrated. I wanted to escape. I felt emotionally overwhelmed that I almost ran away. But instead, I exhaled. I turned my body towards that girl and all her racism. And I asked her five questions that I learned in elementary school. They're the basics. Who, what, when, where, and why? Who did you grow up with? What do you fear? When did you have that experience? Where did you learn that? Why do you feel this way? Now, believe it or not, she and I actually became friends. And I'm not saying this to say that BIPOC communities have to save white people. That's not our job at all. But I am saying that sometimes asking questions is a way to help people solve their own problems. My dad does it to me all the time. Growing up, and now, let's be honest, every time I got in trouble, my dad would tell, ask me why. I would say, because of this and because of that. And he would ask me why. Again, and again, and again. It would drive me insane as a child, but now it's one of the most helpful experiences I've ever had. Most people don't know why they think what they think until you ask, and she and I ended up finding common ground. White people need to understand that there's a reason why we're divided by race. And in asking these questions and redirecting your anger to who really deserves it, we will finally better all of us. I told my dad that I was doing this, and he has translated this into perfect Gen Z slang, so I will leave you with this. Just because I'm securing my bag doesn't mean you're taking the L. Now for the adults in the room, it roughly translates to black success should not trigger white rage. My growth will not bring you down. In case my youthful glow has you fooled, I am not a Gen Zer. I can fully claim the 90s baby title as I was born in 1990. I vividly remember my mom telling me to get off of the internet because I was tying up the phone line and I collected Beanie Babies because I was gonna be a millionaire when I sold them one day. Spoiler alert, I am not a millionaire. Yet, despite growing up well within the millennial era, I have found that I identify with my Gen Z students in many ways. Anecdotally, my views align with the Gen Z majority on systemic racism, LGBTQIA rights, and many other hot button issues of the day. But I was curious to see if I could find data to back this up. And my theory does check out. In 2018, the Pew Research Center in Washington, DC, reported that millennial and Gen Z views on climate change are virtually identical. And we share many of the same social and political views. We have a lot in common. But what I'm really here to talk about today is a difference. Gen Z has harnessed confidence and community much earlier in life than the generations to have come before them. And it's something that we can all still tap into and benefit from. When engaging with my Gen Z students, I often find that they are even more resolute in their progressive views than I am and confident in their adult identities. I am a first generation college graduate from a southern hometown and although I've spent over half of my life outside of that hometown and my views have diverged drastically, you will see none of this on my social media accounts. I post virtually nothing significant about my life. This fear of challenging those that I have grown to differ from led me to study breakaway guilt in graduate school. Breakaway guilt is a phenomenon described by sociologist Howard London. London theorizes that first generation students experience shame and even mourning as they separate from their family to pursue social mobility as a university student. This is especially true as that student begins to form an identity outside of their family unit. And it was especially true for me. But London's work was written in 1989 and working with today's college students made me think a bit 
Well, a lot differently. In 2019, I began working with college students, majority of who are Gen Zers, and I started to see their social media accounts. Theirs are not like mine. They live for posting their authentic lives and selves. And if mom, dad, or friends from high school have a problem, they assertively, yet gracefully, engage in civil discourse. Gen Z has tapped into a level of maturity and confidence in their beliefs and views that millennials, Gen Xers, and baby boomers do not come into until much later in life. How is that the case? When they live in a polarizing and uncertain world. Here's my theory. In 2019, NPR reported that over half of Americans now have a cell phone by age 11. And the Pew Research Center reported that 97% of 13 to 17 year olds have at least one social media account. Gen Z has always existed in the world of global connectivity. They have regional, national, and global perspectives at their fingertips literally 24 seven. And this results in a confidence in their communities far earlier than the generations that have come before them. I first joined Facebook when I was a sophomore in high school and my newsfeed was just an echo chamber of all of my friends that I knew in life. My views did begin to diverge when I attended undergrad, but I didn't fully feel normal in that until I moved to Portland, Oregon in my late 20s. Gen Z does not have to wait until their late 20s. They can find, follow, and subscribe to millions of diverse voices from, well, age 11. In 2019, McKinsey and Company reported that Gen Z continuously flows through online communities that promote their progressive views, resulting in a radically inclusive generation. And 66% of Gen Z believe that community is created by cause and interest, not background and education. Gen Z begin to build identity and community prior to their teen years outside the confines of their geographical boundaries, resulting in a confidence and community that us older generations take a lot longer to find. But us old folks are on social media now. And McKinsey theorizes that Gen Z is the most visible generation to have ever lived. And us older generations are now following their lead. There has been an explosion of pro-LGBTQIA content on TikTok, and most of those users are not Gen Z. Megan Elliott, a fellow millennial, recently wrote an article reporting that she joined TikTok for the cute animal videos. I mean, same. But what she found was the queer validation and community that she had been yearning for her entire life. Those who used to live on the fringes of society are now realizing in droves that not only are they not alone, but they're normal. There is a global community out there that is willing to share, laugh, cry, and challenge. Gen Z, by simply existing authentically in the spaces provided to them, are changing our behavioral and social norms. They are breaking us all, young and old, out of the molds that we've been trying to fit ourselves into for decades. And we could all use a little bit more commitment to that, that type of progress. So go download TikTok, Twitter, anywhere you can find people that are like and not so like you. Different is in. Discourse is encouraged, and accountability, you can count on it. Hello, I'm Natalie Welch, and I'm an Eastern Cherokee woman, and I'm not a mascot. But I do believe in the power of sport for positive social change. So I, uh, being a Cherokee woman, uh, I hope for many of you, you may understand a little bit more about that, what, what that means, but uh, for a lot of folks, Cherokee is a very common uh, ancestral heritage to claim uh, without really any meaning behind it. So we'll often joke in our community about how anytime we meet someone and we tell them we're Cherokee, they, they respond and say, oh, well, my, my great grandma was Cherokee. And it's always grandma, it's never grandpa. 
And so we always have a good laugh about that. And my mom, that's her on the left, me in the middle, and her dad and my grandpa on the right. Uh, she always has a really great response when she meets people and tells them that she's Cherokee and they say their great grandma was Cherokee. She says, uh, well, my great grandma was white. And that always just meets the greatest like kind of blank stare. Uh, but it was true. My, my great-great-grandma was white. Uh, my great-great-grandpa married a white woman. Uh, and this mostly happened because he ended up going to Carlisle Indian School, a boarding school in Pennsylvania. So uh, it's not the normal boarding school you may think of when you think of uh, maybe a nice prep school with a ton of amenities for rich kids. Uh, so these boarding schools were actually meant to assimilate Native youth and really strip them of their culture, strip them of their traditions and all the things that they kind of knew. They were taken from their homes and their families and sent to these schools to be civilized and to be taught the ways of the white man. And so my, uh, my great grandpa, uh, Nick, he was, he was sent to one of these boarding schools and, and kind of thrown into this world uh, unlike any he'd ever known. And you know, at the same time these boarding schools were being established, teams were starting to use native mis mascots and native nicknames. And so it was really hard for me to reckon with this idea of native mascots honoring you when at the same time they're trying to strip away your entire culture and your entire tradition, the things that they're also putting and branding and monetizing. And so my great, great, my great grandpa Nick was a really good ball player, baseball player and he would go on to play in the minor leagues. And that's when he met uh, his, his wife, Edith, and uh, caused a little bit of a media a firestorm at the time because of the age difference. But I love this article because it points out that uh, Nick Bradley, AKA Chief, uh, as his nickname, and it's kind of a common joke that any native man, anytime he leaves a reservation or his native community, he goes by the nickname chief. Uh, so I, I just find that really funny and uh, kind of a sign of the times as well. So he married my great great grandma Edith and they returned to Cherokee, North Carolina where they ended up having nine kids including my grandpa. And uh, I was really lucky to grow up in this family. I had this amazing family support, huge extended family. And our entire community really rallied around sports. It was something that was really just a passion and a pastime because like most reservations, we didn't have a lot to do growing up. And I was of the older millennial generation where we didn't have technology at our fingertips. So we played a lot of time, spent a lot of time playing sports. And, and I played just about everything, but I was not good. I have never had good eye co hand eye coordination. I stick to running now. But I, I loved it. I loved the culture of sports. I loved how our community really rallied around um, each other. And traditional sports like stickball, um, I loved the way our women's team, state champions, basketball, were just as supported as our men's. I loved how we packed the stands on Friday night for football games. And we always said we weren't playing for our, tr our school, we were playing for our tribe and our nation. Uh, but of course, we, we've experienced racism. We, we played some teams who were um, pretty, uh, pretty blatant about their racism and they would put up signs uh, before our games saying, you know, the Trail of Tears starts here or, um, you know, part two Trail of Tears. And it just got really, really blatant and really, really offensive to the point where they put up a sign saying white power, supposedly based on their coach being named, last name White. But um, I'm sure it had nothing to do with race. And so we, we, uh, we dealt with these things as a, as a community, though. And we didn't have to face this stuff alone. And I never felt personally attacked. I always felt like this was just kind of the way things were. But my community, we were strong together. And I didn't, just didn't realize how bad this racism would be once I left. And, I ended up uh, going over to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, just about two hours away from the reservation. And I, I really was just kind of like a fish out of water, honestly, culture shock to the, to the utmost point. And I, um, while I love the culture of sport at Tennessee, I, there was also a lot of things I didn't love. I didn't love being asked if I grew up in a teepee. 
I went to a student health care center one day and um, you know you're sick and you're not feeling well and you have a nurse who looks at your kind of your chart and asks, oh are you one of those engines like like out of an old like 50s like Western and so those kind of things just like those little microaggressions and these all these things where people just didn't know anything about a tribe and a people who were just you know two hours away and who f for not long ago were all over the southeast and so i started to realize this kind of intersection of sport and society and just how race played into that and thinking about our student athletes in tennessee most of whom were black and how their relationships with their white coaches and other white students um, were very different. And so I got to see a really uh, different side of sports. And I started to, you know, growing up, I thought we have bigger issues than mascots. You know, we have diabetes, we have really ish bad issues with drugs and alcohol. Um, that those are bigger issues, were bigger issues to me at the time. I didn't see the connections between the perpetual stereotypes and how they could act as a catalyst for this cycle of kind of historical trauma. And, you know, I, I really just didn't, didn't see how that connection was made. But now, you know, years later, being away from the reservation and constantly having my identity questioned, I began to see why this historical trauma of stereotypical abuse uh, was just amplified by these mascots. And, you know, people, people often say, well, you know, what about uh, the Seminoles of Florida? They have a really great relationship with the, with the, universe, uh, the Florida State University. Um, and this is just one example, but, um, you know, they say they work together. And this is the Florida, the Florida State and the Seminole tribe of Florida but most people don't know there's a Florida State or a Seminole tribe of Oklahoma. And this tribe doesn't get any of the benefits that the Florida tribe does. And they're very much against these native mascots. And so it's not as easy as just getting permission for a, a mascot to be used. Uh, and then you think about two, I want you to think about, well, why does this matter for me? What does this have to do with me? I think it has to do with how fast our, our worlds are moving. Just in 2020, you saw the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and this whole kind of racial and social unrest around race. And at the same time, we're going through a, a pandemic, a global pandemic. And in the middle of all this, the Washington football team decides to finally drop their, their nickname, their slur, racial slur that they've been using for, for decades that they said they would never change and that activists have fought against for decades. And then the Cleveland Indians decide they're going to change their name. And slowly but surely, all these little movements in the sports world and the corporate world starts to feel like we're building some momentum. And obviously, we're not all the way there yet. You still see teams do some maybe more performative things. The uh, irony and a end racism slogan in a end zone with a, a chief's mascot is not lost on me. Um, and I, but I want to stress too that this isn't cancel culture. This isn't being a snowflake. This is about really systemic, long-standing bigotry and explicit and implicit racism and biases that have such wide-ranging ramifications, not just on me as a Native woman, but on all of us in society. And I want you to, to think about how even if you're not into sports, if we can all just think of one each other, think of one each one, think of each other as more human than I think, and not mascots, then I think we'd all be better off.